Second half of May 1942. On the 27th of May, 79 years before this episode comes out to the day, two Czech special operations executive agents strike at the heart of the Nazi leadership by going after the main architect of the Holocaust, the man with the iron heart, Reinhard Heydrich. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the first half of May, a refugee crisis started costing tens of thousands of lives in Burma while the Japanese continued their fast advance across British imperial territory. Winston Churchill responded to the German Bedecker Blitz, the raid on historic British cities, saying that We are in a position to carry into Germany many times the tonnage of high explosives which he can send here. Auschwitz-Birkenau and Sobibor have started the systematic gassing of arriving Jewish, Romani, and Sinti people, bringing the total of active extermination factories to four. It is now, in the second half of May 1942, that they all pick up pace and start killing at capacity. Deportations of Jews to the extermination factories have been ongoing since many weeks across Europe, but so far these have been relatively limited in scope, with a greater proportion of victims still being collected in occupied Poland. But all of that now changes. This comes after a complete takeover of all Jewish affairs on Polish territory by the SS. Until now, the task had been shared with Hans Frank's Generalgouvernement administration, but in late March, early April, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler and his second-in-command, the director of the Reich Main Security Office and military dictator of occupied Czechia, Reinhard Heydrich, use a corruption scandal involving Frank to oust him from any control over Jewish operations. Now, Frank was on board with the genocide of all Jews, but he was also in favor of delaying some murders until the Jews had been worn down as slave labor. His boss, German Führer Adolf Hitler, Himmler, and Heydrich want the Jews gone and gone now. Just before the pace of killing is picked up, Hitler and Himmler meet on April 23rd. Then Himmler and Heydrich have long meetings in Munich on April 28th and 30th, followed by another meeting in Prague on May 2nd. The next day, Himmler has returned to Berlin, where he again meets Hitler. Shortly after these meetings, both deportations across Europe and the rate of mass killings in all four of the extermination factories begin to increase. This is how Gerlach analyzes the events in his biography on Heydrich. No record of these meetings have survived the war, but the chronology of the events of the following week suggests that it was during these meetings that Hitler, Himmler, and Heydrich decided on the framework for the implementation of a pan-European program of systematic destruction that was to be carried out from May 1942 onwards. That is not the only operation that increases in scope in these two weeks, though. The British bombing of German civilian targets is about to go into overdrive. The debate with Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the RAF Bomber Command that we have partly followed during previous weeks has been concluded. Although Churchill has continuously expressed doubt that an area bombing campaign will have decisive impact in the war, the head of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris, has prevailed. Churchill's cabinet has tasked scientific advisor Justice Singleton to tell them what results we are likely to achieve from continuing our air attacks on Germany at the greatest possible strength for periods of 6, 12, and 18 months. The Singleton report concludes that if Germany prevails on the Eastern Front, bombing Germany will have no decisive effect. If the Germans do not prevail in the East, it might have some effect. Singleton admits that he is not in any position to predict the outcome of an extended bombing campaign, but in his conclusion he equivocates. But the drain on Germany will be present all the time. If Russia stands, it will remain a powerful weapon on our hands. And then finally comes to the conclusion that 
If Russia can hold Germany on land, I doubt whether Germany will stand 12 or 18 months. Continuous, intensified, and increased bombing affecting, as it must, her war production, her power of resistance, her industries, and her will to resist, by which I mean morale. For Churchill, this means that he can justifiably pursue two goals, satisfy the popular calls for harsh retribution for the Blitz, and placate Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin by opening up the second front in the West that Stalin has been calling for, even if committing to a land war is at this point virtually impossible. Let me once again point out that here in the spring of 1942, not only have previous analyses concluded that such a bombing campaign will have limited effect and no decisive effect, and that it is uncontrollable and will kill defenseless civilians, but also that Singleton too admits that the outcome is doubtful when he writes, I do not think a bombing offensive ought to be regarded as of itself sufficient to win the war or produce decisive results. The area is too vast for the effort we can put forth. Nevertheless, the report gives enough cover for Churchill's administration to proceed, and Harris is now about to get his first prized thousand bomber raid for what he dubs Operation Millennium. Harris scrambles every bomber he can find, but meets resistance. Coastal Command withdraws their own bombers from the operation, fearing that Harris' methods gain popularity at the expense of the deployment of bombers in the Battle of the Atlantic. But by adding crews still in training, unready for deployment, he manages to put together an air force the likes of which the world has never before seen. It is 1,047 planes, including 602 Wellington bombers and 131 Halifaxes. Initially, the target is supposed to be Hamburg, but due to distance considerations, they finally set her for Cologne. Late on May 30th, they take off. At quarter past midnight, the air raid sirens go off all across the ancient city that dates back to Roman times, and soon 500 tons of explosives and 1,000 tons of incendiary bombs rain down over its rooftops. More than 2,500 fires, of which 1,700 large, break out. But in difference to Lübeck a few weeks earlier, there are fewer wooden houses and a firestorm does not follow. The damage is still considerable. 3,330 buildings are destroyed and 2,090 are seriously damaged. Out of these, 2,560 commercial and industrial buildings are demolished, putting 36 large firms temporarily out of business. 13,010 homes are destroyed, 6,360 are seriously damaged, and over 22,000 are lightly damaged. Nine hospitals, seven churches, and 16 schools are gone. Over 45,000 people are left homeless, and many more flee the city. Most civilians manage to take cover, though, but between four and five hundred are killed and several thousand wounded. Cologne, Lubeck, Rostock, those are only just the beginning. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany, clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquests and even seeking foolishly for more, will make a most interesting initial experiment. The following weeks, the Nazi government will issue generous financial compensation and alternative housing for the victims, in part by using confiscated property of Jews that are already bound for the extermination factories. Across Europe, the Nazi crackdown on Jews continues. Jews are now forced to wear visible yellow stars of David in Belgium from May 27th onwards and in Paris starting on June 7th. This idea to drive a wedge between those classified as non-Jews and Jews is not always going as smoothly as the Nazi ideologues have hoped, though. In the Netherlands, the Yellow Star has been obligatory for several weeks now, and on May 21st, Heinrich Himmler writes, 
The Jewish problem is a key issue in the Netherlands. The Jewish have received stars of David. This led to the grotesque situation where even some real Dutchmen are wearing a star of David in protest. Apparently, such people exist as well. The information about these events are coming to the Nazi leaders through the Meldungen aus dem Reich, which are secret protocols about the political situation in the Nazi German Reich. In May, there are increasing reports about rising popular dissatisfaction with the war in the East, and Hitler is concerned. He sees visions of a popular uprising ruining his chances of victory, similar to the stab-in-the-back myth that he believes cost the Germans an imaginary possibility of victory during the Great War. On May 22nd, he tells his guests that the creation of a home front of scoundrels like in 1918 has to be avoided. On May 23rd, he says to Nazi leaders that Heinrich Himmler has to shoot the criminals in all concentration camps rather than to let them loose on the German people. The Meldungen aus dem Reich reports are compiled by the SS Sicherheitsdienst Reinhard Heydrich's department, and he personally is about to face the hard consequences of popular dissent. Ever since he took over as acting Reich protector of Bohemia and Moravia, he has been ruling occupied Czechia with an iron fist, albeit wearing a velvet glove. An iron fist to suppress any potential resistance. Under his orders, 6,000 potential opposition organizers have been arrested, out of which 404 have been executed. Several thousands of those not killed immediately have been deported to the Mutthausen concentration camp. Of the 1,299 deported in his first two months alone, only 52 will survive their internment. He has established the Theresienstadt ghetto from where 34,000 Czech, German, and Austrian Jews will be deported to be murdered in the Generalgouvernement. His ruthless enforcement has earned him the nickname the Butcher of Prague. But the Butcher wears a velvet glove to exploit Czech workers for gain before he fulfills his plan to deport them all east to Germanize Czechia completely after the war is over. He plans precise rationing of food, narrowly defined freedoms, and special treatment for Nazi sympathizers and, of course, Czechs of German ethnicity. His carrot and stick policies are precise and executed with deadly precision. Heydrich has reduced sabotage acts by 73% within six months, and he believes the situation in Czechia to be so secure that he makes a point of being driven daily through the capital of Prague in an open car to demonstrate his power and invulnerability. But as May proceeds, he has growing concerns about a rise in opposition and resistance. On May 26, he holds a press conference where he echoes Hitler's fears. I feel and see that the foreign propaganda and the defeatist anti-German propagandist rumors circulating are increasing considerably. Also, small acts of sabotage, albeit less damaging than the oppositional spirit, are on the rise. Little does he know that the very next day he will reap the whirlwind he has sown firsthand. Reports of the draconian rule reach London and the Czechoslovakian government in exile under President Edvard Benes from day one. Now, it's important to note that the Allies do not know of Heydrich's personal role as lead architect of the Holocaust at this point, but they do know of his key role overall within the Nazi system. Benesch believes that eliminating Heydrich from the equation will be a severe blow that serves three purposes at once. Destabilizing the Nazi administration in Czechia to enable more resistance, solidify public support inside Czechia for the government in exile, show the other allies that the Czechoslovaks are determined to continue fighting for their land. He commences the Brits at his plan, and the British Special Operations Executive starts preparing a group of agents for an assassination mission. Operation Anthropoid. The name is, wittingly or unwittingly, an ironic jab at the Nazi idea of a master race. Anthropoid, from ancient Greek, means human-like. Selected for the actual attack are Josef Gabczyk and Jan Kubisch. Both of them, ethnic Czechs who joined the French Foreign Legion in 1939 and fought in France 1940 with Kubisch earning a Croix de Guerre. 
since the fall of France. They've been part of the Czechoslovak forces in exile in Britain and have been trained as paratroopers. At the end of this past December 1941, they and a support team parachuted into Bohemia, made their way to Prague, where for five months they have now been setting up a support network and completed the detailed planning of the assassination. While they proceed, the local resistance leaders try to dissuade them from the attack for reasons that it might have very limited real effect on the fear of draconian reprisals. In London, Banish too is asked by people in touch with the Czech resistance to call it off, but the plans proceed. They know that Heidrich takes a daily route in his open Mercedes limousine from his house to either the airport or his office. The route has a fairly sharp curve where the driver, SS Obergruppenführer Johannes Klein, has to slow down. And it is here that the two attackers have traveled on bikes and wait on opposite sides of the road in the morning of May 27th. Just after 10.30 a.m., Heidrich arrives as expected. Gabchik pulls out a Sten machine gun he has been hiding under a raincoat, but it jams. Heidrich sees the man with the gun pointed at him and outraged orders Klein to halt, stands up in the car and fires a Luger pistol at Gabchik, but misses. However, the car has come to halt near Kubish, who now hurls a modified anti-tank grenade at the Mercedes. He misjudges the distance. The grenade bounces off the side of the car and explodes on the pavement near to the rear wheel where Heidrich is standing. The explosion sends shrapnel, parts of the car, upholstery pieces, and shreds of uniform material into Heidrich's body. As he is thrown back into the seat of the car, his right lung, his spleen, and his diaphragm are ruptured and his liver punctured. He has several entry wounds in his arm and leg on the side of the explosion. Klein is sent tumbling out of the car with minor shrapnel wounds. A tram that is just passing has its windows blown out, injuring dozens of passengers with the flying shards, none life-threatening though. Both wounded SS men get up. Heidrich stumbles out of the smoldering car and starts firing at Kubisch, who is struggling with his bike. Klein tries to fire at Gabchik, who has now drawn his pistol and is trying to get on his bike as well, but Klein is stunned by the concussion and fails to use his pistol. Kubisch abandons the bike and starts running from the scene under fire by Heidrich, who is still shooting while he collapses on the ground in visible pain. Gabchik gets on his bike and starts pedaling for his life. Firing his cult pistol in the air to disperse the gathering crowds, he escapes, but with Klein in pursuit on Heidrich's orders. Both Czech agents get away narrowly. Heidrich is cared for by passers-by and whisked off to hospital. After several operations to mend his lung, liver, and diaphragm, remove the foreign objects and his spleen, he is transferred into the care of the best SS doctors available, especially flown in. By May 30th, he is on morphine for the pain, but is recovering well. Meanwhile, a massive manhunt is underway for Kubish and Gabchik, as of yet unidentified by the Nazis, and in hiding. In Berlin, Himmler and Hitler are outraged and vow revenge. As May 1942 ends, although the chief architect of the Holocaust is seriously wounded in hospital, the war against humanity is far from over. The shots in Prague do not change much for now. The juggernaut of death that has been let loose on the world is too heavy and has too much momentum to be halted by the elimination of one individual driving it on. No matter how central that perpetrator is, the steamroller of hate and destruction is on a downhill roll and there is little mankind can do except throw itself in its way to at least start breaking its pace. If nothing else, that is what Josef Gabchik and Jan Kubisch have done. They have resisted. Our mission is to remind us all to resist the temptation to even send that steamroller on its way in the first place. Join that effort by getting Time Ghost memorabilia at our collectible store and joining the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Never forget. <laughs>